He was the great storyteller of British film, whose relatively slim oeuvre contains some of the best-loved works of the post-war cinema. David Lean began his film career more than 60 years ago in these very studios, then British Gaumont, now BBC Lime Grove. In time-honoured fashion, he worked his way up from a lowly capacity to become Britain's most sought-after and highly paid film editor, before being entrusted to co-direct In Which We Serve with Noel Coward. His handling of another Coward script, Brief Encounter, made his reputation in America, and it was there that he was largely to pursue his career from the late 50s, after bringing Dickens's Great Expectations and Oliver Twist triumphantly to the screen. His breakthrough to the ranks of international directors came with The Bridge on the River Kwai, which won six Oscars and established Lean as the master explorer of psychology in an epic setting. The films that followed, Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago, also dealt with the big themes in a way that brilliantly reconciled the intimate with the epic set piece. A 12-year hiatus from filmmaking after Ryan's daughter ended in 1984 with a passage to India, which resulted in an Indian summer of critical attention for the veteran director. With me in the studio to talk about David Lean's contribution to the cinema are director Terence Davis and screenwriter Christopher Hampton. But first, The Guardian's film critic, Derek Malcolm. It would be difficult to think of another British filmmaker, Alfred Hitchcock apart, whose films have attracted more people into the cinema than David Lean. Certainly there was no other British director whose films gathered so many Oscars. Yet for 12 years of his life, he was unable to make any films at all, and the critical appreciation of him had, until the last few years of his life, always been muted and often hostile. But you don't have to like all or even any of David Lean's pictures to realize that he was something like a great man of the cinema. He was, at my estimation, the complete professional who knew his trade from the initial storyboard to the final editing inside out. A David Lean film could not possibly have been made by anyone else. They all bore his signature, and that signature, more often than not, gave enjoyment to millions. His capacity to please while still being an absolute perfectionist who often spent money like water and months shooting a film is what made him unique. He was attacked as well as praised for it, lambasted for his populism and for his lack of subtlety. So much so, in fact, that after the grandiose but empty Ryan's Daughter, he didn't work again for 12 years. But the lean of Ryan's Daughter, Dr. Zhivago, Lawrence of Arabia, and Bridge on the River Kwai was very different from the director who, as a young man, learned his trade as an editor in the early 30s. He joined British Gaumont Studios as a tea boy in 1927 and worked his way up to director on the wartime drama Noel Coward's In Which We Serve. This collaboration led to one of the most affectionately remembered of all British films, Brief Encounter. It's been so very nice. I've enjoyed my afternoon enormously. I'm so glad. So have I. I apologize for boring you with long medical words. I feel dull and stupid not to be able to understand more. Shall I see you again? It's the other platform, isn't it? You'll have to run. Don't bother about me. It might not do for a few minutes. Shall I see you again? Yes, of course. Perhaps you'll come out to catch with one Sunday. It's rather far, I know, but we should be delighted. Please. Please. What is it? Next Thursday. The same time. No, I couldn't possibly. Please. I ask you most humbly. For all its clipped English and stiff upper lips, Brief Encounter could never be accused of being overblown. Nor could his two brilliantly cinematic Dickens adaptations, Oliver Twist and Great Expectations.
keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. No, sir, no. What happened to him later was curious. He seemed to want to inflate everything to beyond its normal size, so that you could often say that inside every lean film was an even leaner one screaming to get out. He seemed conscious, after Ryan's daughter, that the grandiose side of him was perhaps getting a little old-fashioned, or at least out of fashion. I'm just an old white elephant, he said to me once on the set of E.M. Foster's Passage to India. I'm having to learn how to be a filmmaker all over again. That was nonsense, of course, since he knew more about the process from A to Z than anybody around him. And Passage to India proved it, not by being an accurate translation of Forster, but by seeming quintessentially a lean film. Conrad seemed made for him, and right up to his death, he was still planning to make Nostromo as his last great epic, with another director standing by in case he dropped. Now we shall never see it, and that's a pity. No more grand gestures from the British cinema, no more great epics, no more great romantic flourishes, exquisitely framed and cut to perfection. Lean wasn't so much a white elephant as a filmmaker unable to swim in shallow times, unable to comprehend why the public wouldn't still flock to his kind of storytelling. Perhaps they would, but for a large slice of his later years, the financiers wouldn't let him try. What he leaves behind him, though, is a pretty formidable legacy. Brief Encounter, Great Expectations, and Lawrence of Arabia were unbeatable in their very different ways, made by a master craftsman who was also an artist. For audiences, these and other films will remain alive well into the 21st century, and for filmmakers, they're an invaluable source of study. Lean's last public appearance was when he received the American Film Institute Award last year in Hollywood, when a younger generation of filmmakers paid tribute to a master. It was two of his films, The Bridge of the River Kwai and Lawrence of Arabia, that most made me want to be a filmmaker. Derek Malcolm. Earlier this evening, The Late Show talked to the film director, Bernard Forehouse, for whom Lean worked as an editor back in the 30s. Anthony Havelock Allen, who produced some of Lean's early British films. Film critic, Dillis Powell. And by phone from America, director, Martin Scorsese. Well, I first, uh, first noticed the editing of British Movie Tone News and uh, was very struck with how fast it was and how imaginative, quite unusual cutting. So I contacted Keith Ayling, who was the producer, and asked him who his editor was. He said, oh, we've taken on a young kid who really seems to have very interesting ideas. And uh, I met him, talked to him, and when I was directing my first film, I... Uh, phoned Keith and said, uh, Keith, would you be very upset if I asked uh, your cutter, David Lean, to do my film? So Keith wasn't really a bit happy, but he couldn't very well obstruct his chance to break into feature films. I can't see them anywhere. Wait a minute. Here you are, dear. If you men had the jobs of tidying up the rooms, you wouldn't make them into such a mess. It's your tidying up that makes me lose things. Why can't you leave everything where I put it? I was sure he would want to direct and uh, certainly had a future in it. I can't say that I could foresee the bridge over the River Kwai or <laughs> some of the other masterpieces which he's achieved, but certainly I, I saw great promise there. <laughs> Because he was an editor and an extremely good one, one of the best that's ever been, he saw films in terms of editing. That's to say, he saw each shot as he proposed to cut it when it was shot. 
I became fascinated by it. I still think it's a kind of magic sitting here and juxtaposing images. It's a wonderful job, most interesting the whole lot. In a way, he really stands for me as the beginning of British cinema as I know it. There were three directors who all, they were all born within a few years of each other, and they all made their beginnings in the late 30s and the beginning of the 40s. And he was one of them. The other two were Michael Pyle and Carol Reed. And to me, they stand for the British cinema as I know it and care about it. He was a wonderful storyteller. He had the most superb visual eye. He had a wonderful capacity for creating a, f a picture of the place where the action was taking place, which made the audience feel that they were there. I mean, if you had never been to the desert in your life and you once saw Lawrence of Arabia, you would know what the desert felt like, looked like, almost smelt like. This was also true of Bridge on the River Kwai. Perhaps you are not aware that the bridge is now under my personal command. Really? May I ask, are you satisfied with the work? I am not. You proved my point. I hate the British. You are defeated, but you have no shame. You are stubborn, but have no pride. You endure, but you have no courage. I hate the British. I'm very old now. I've had, as it were, a kind of classical training in films. And uh, I find it hard, even at my age, to be able to make any great statements about life. And uh, so I, I try to tell a story. David was first and foremost a storyteller. He was not an intellectual film director or a polemical film director. He had no sociological or political aims. If one was to transfer his work into terms of literature, he was a, a writer haggard, a, a Rudyard Kipling, a wonderful teller of stories. I think he had a, a gift which was not really very passionate. I think perhaps the best directors in the world, taking by direction as something which belongs to us all, are people who have a passion about a certain kind of life, about living, about working. I don't think he had that passion. I think he had a passion for the cinema. Bridge on the River Kwai, and then, uh, of course, Lawrence Arabia, and, and uh, finally Dr. Zhivago. The um, the idea of the motion picture screen is a massive um, canvas reflecting almost the uh, the um, masterworks of uh, the 19th and the uh, 18th century, and and, uh, and uh, moving pictures, you know, <laughs> moving canvases, you know, and uh, uh, we're always overwhelmed. Myself, and as a as a as a young person and then uh, later on as a filmmaker, always overwhelmed by uh, his ability to, uh, to, uh, uh, to be so clear in his imagery and uh, so precise. And that's not even beginning to, well, how should I put it, uh, later when I became a filmmaker and, and began to try to block scenes or try to, <laughs> try to deal with um, uh, groups of people or crowds of people, uh, I began to realize the, uh, the enormity uh, of the task which he was such a master at. Hut, hut, hut. Hut, hut, hut. <laughs> I think we have lost the greatest British director and uh, one of the greatest directors in the world.
I don't think anyone surpasses him. It's a, it's a great and a sad loss. Well, I think he's a great loss to world cinema because there are, it's becoming more and more difficult for purely reasons of finance to make epic films. They're, today, an epic film can cost anything up to 65, 70 million dollars, and it's very difficult to get that kind of money. David had a remarkable reputation for making these very big films, but never, never was there any extravagance, was there any self-indulgence in the making of them. He never wasted money, ever. He was the most efficient director that you could imagine, and therefore, if you were going to have an epic film made, you were much safer in the hands of David Lean than you might be in somebody with less experience, with less capacity for visualizing the, visualizing the end product than he had. In, in my estimation, he's a great master, a great master, of very, very much in the, in the tradition of the, 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 the great directors of England, you know, um, uh, Hitchcock, and Michael Powell, and um, Carol Reed, and David Lean. These are the great, great four directors. I, I feel four great directors in England. Uh, there are many other very, very good directors. I, but I, uh, uh, the authority of his imagery, David Lean's imagery, uh, will be looked upon for many years to come uh, with great awe. I think. Martin Scorsese ending that report. Derek Malcolm is still with me in the studio and joining us a screenwriter Christopher Hampton who worked with Lean on the script for what was to have been his next film, Nostromo, and film director Terence Davis. Christopher, I can turn to you first. Um, we've heard that you were collaborating with David Lean towards the end of his life. What was your experience of working with him as a writer? Um, well, he certainly didn't waste any time. I went in on the first day and uh, sat down and he looked across the desk and said, well, how should we start? What is the first image of the film? Uh, I hadn't uh, you know, I'd done a certain amount of work with, with other directors, but I hadn't worked with someone who worked through from the beginning to the end um, of the first draft before a word was put on paper, um, who then, you know, I suppose paced up and down impatiently while one went away and scribbled it down as fast as one could, and then immediately began work on the second draft. I was working on, on, on the script for, for a year. Um, in the end, I had to go because um, I had to go and uh, uh, write Dangerous Liaison, which uh, found itself in a competitive situation. Uh, that's to say there was another film on the same theme and I had to go and uh, um, join the race. Um, but I learned an, e an enormous amount from him. I mean, more than, more than from working with anyone else. Uh, about, you know, he just swept away all those uh, 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 theatre writer feelings. Um, uh, he was very suspicious of people from the theatre that it was somehow easier to write film than to write for the theatre. He, he kind of pointed out that it was, uh, he just demonstrated that it was uh, just as demanding and, pro and very likely more so. He has been criticised in the past for being more concerned with images than words, but that doesn't seem to have been borne out by your experience, certainly. No, and I think he had very good relations with writers all through, all through his career, starting off, of course, with, with Noel Coward. But he spoke very affectionately ab about uh, Terence Rattigan, about H.G. E. Bates, about about a number of the of the writers that he worked with, and and he 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 collaborated. I, I, I mean, I I only wish I'd had the chance to uh, collaborate with him through the making of a of a film. I mean, I, he was one of those directors who are quite rare who liked to keep the writer in touch with what was going on. Certainly, with with Robert Bolt, uh, uh, he he would have him by the whole time he was making the film. Derek uh, said in his uh, piece that uh, he regarded himself as something of a white elephant. Had he, in your experience, made any concessions to modern filmmaking? Um, I don't know about that. He was very, he was surprisingly self-critical. He, he, he certainly didn't, I, I, had, I didn't know what he would be like and I, I hadn't expected him to be quite so uh, harsh on his own, on his own earlier work um, as he turned out to be and on himself. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think it's often a feature of, of the best artists, uh, although artist was a word that made him extremely uncomfortable, uh, that they that they um, they don't feel uh, that their work is is you know is realizing this this sort of ideal potential that they that they have in their mind. Certainly, he wanted to visualize everything. We had I'd never worked with storyboards before. That was terribly in instructive for me. Maybe uh, I should bring uh, Terence in as a as another very British director. Your own work is po possibly at the other end of the spectrums from Lean, and it's very 
uh, intimate, personal. What did he mean to you as a British director? Well, I love the early work. I mean, um, Great Expectations and Oliver Twist and Brief Encounter. I mean, if you look at the opening of both Oliver Twist and um, Great Expectations, they're pure cinema. They're not in Dickens at all. You know, there's, uh, there's wonderful shots of the Romney Marshes, um, the wonderful shots of Oliver Twist's mother coming to uh, the workhouse. I mean, they are quite extraordinary, and they're cinematic, and th they're wordless, too, which is the best kind of cinema. Um, and in Brief Encounter, um, the, the shots in and around Carnforth Station, which is made both tragic and romantic, Carnforth Station, it's actually quite extraordinary, and he does draw the most extraordinary playing from those people. In, in, in those films, we, ha we had a wealth of actors then, um, Matita Hunt, um, Francis L. Sullivan, you know, as Mr. Jaggers. I mean, uh, they're incomparable, and indeed Celia Johnson was. Um, but I think those images in those films will remain because they are pure cinema, um, and they don't rely on talk, and they don't rely on the juxtapositions of people talking. They rely purely on the juxtapositions of images, which is what cinema is. Because if you juxtapose one image with something else, an ambiguity arises between it, and we, the audience, work out what the ambiguity is. And he knew that, certainly in the early films. And I think if you look at them, they make the domestic seem epic. Was he an original? Did he, what did he actually add to the grammar of the filmmaker? Well, what he did um, was that to take very wordy scripts, like Brief Encounter, which is... Uh, from a, a stage play called Still Life. Um, and it's very, very wordy. I mean, he actually makes it seem less wordy. Um, and the use of the Rachmaninoff concerto, for instance, I mean, is, is lovely. Um, and what he, m he makes it seem less wordy because he concentrates on the minutiae of um, trains arriving at 616 and lovely things like that. Um, but what he does add, he does add an eye and what goes into the mise-en-scene. He knew exactly what you should see. And that was more important than what you necessarily heard. Derek, what do you think his legacy will be? What does what he uh, bequeath to the br subsequent generations of filmmakers? Well, I think he proves one thing, and that was Truffaut was talking rubbish, when he said there was no such thing as a British film, because he was a man of the cinema. His films were real films. And people say he's a great editor, as he was. But what does editing do? It puts emotion onto the screen. That's what he did. He may not have been a passionate man, as Dillis Pearl says, but by goodness, he got passion onto the screen somehow. Um, and I think he's really one of the three greatest. As Dillis said, Michael Powell, Alfred Hitchcock, David Lean, possibly even in that order, I don't know. But he, he's a, he was a great man. He knew everything about the cinema. And not very many British directors can really be said that they, they really know all that. So was he the last great British filmmaker, as Scorsese said there? Oh, I think there'll be one or two more in the future. I hope so. There's one. Is his work <laughs> still relevant um, to filmmakers now? I mean, people like Spielberg and Lucas have obviously taken up elements of it. Are, are there any British filmmakers who are, who are capable of uh, handling that sort of epic theme Well, now? I think there would be, but they've got no money. That's the problem. I mean, it's very difficult to do something like that on one and a half million pounds. You know, you need 20 million, and uh, it's not forthcoming. I think there would be if only there was some money. He had to get his money elsewhere. If I can just end by asking you all for your own personal favourites of Lean's films. Derek? Oh, Great Expectations, I think. Why? Because it's a wonderful, wonderful adaptation of a book without being anything like the book at all. It's a piece of cinema. It's Dickens in the cinema, which is very different. Christopher, unfortunately, we never got to see your own collaboration with Lean, but what would your favourite be? Well, actually, on that first day, he said to me, uh, well, what is your favourite of my films? I said, <laughs> it was a rather alarming question. <laughs> So I thought for a moment, and I said, great expectations, and he said, quite right. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> <laughs> Terence? Much as I love great expectations, um, it's brief encounter for me, simply because it has an incomparable performance, performances from Celia Johnson and Trevor Howard. I mean, they are exquisite performances. Uh, it's brief encounter for me. Thanks very much. Terence Davis, Christopher Hampton, Derek Malcolm. David Lean, who died today.